Chapter 6 is all about lists. I think you're going to find once you get used to using lists, as particularly in Python, that it's going to be a great tool to use in your programming. It's going to really give you a lot of new options and it's going to make your programming code a lot easier once you get used to them. Let's think about reasons for using needing a list. One reason we're going to need a list is because in many of our programs we need to collect a large number of values. Think about the bowling scores program that we did back in chapter 4. You asked the user to enter many bowling scores. You could have entered only 3 or 4, but you might have entered 10, 20, 30, lots and lots of bowling scores. And maybe you want to keep track of all of them. We didn't keep track of them in our bowling scores program. We just got a sum so we could find the high and the low. But we didn't keep track of them. Many times we want to actually keep track of those numbers. And to do so with individual variables would get pretty unruly. Also, those number of values can be changed. So let's say that I'm going to always do 10 bowling scores. I could do 10 variables, and we could work with it. But what if those number of bowling scores is going to change? Sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 30. I don't want to declare 100 variables and then sometimes use 10 or 20. That really isn't very efficient programming. So a list is going to be uh, allow you to collect a large number of values and those value, the number of values we collect can change from run to run. It doesn't always have to be the same. It's going to be a very flexible way to program. What is a list? It is the fundamental mechanism in Python for collecting multiple values and just giving it one name so it's easy to access. It is a container that stores a collection of values which in programming we call elements. These values or elements are stored in sequential order. So the first one we put in will be first, then the second one. So it's not going to all get mixed up in a jumble. It, they are going to stay in sequential order of some sort all the time. The list can grow or shrink in size. We can add elements or we can take away elements. And the data or values that we store in a list can be of any data type. So you can have a list of integers. You can have a list of floats, a list of strings, you can have a list of Boolean variables, you can even have a list of lists. But whatever you store, all elements should be related. So if I'm going to store test scores, I should just store test scores only. I shouldn't mix it with names and test scores. Now Python will let you do that, but it's not very useful and you could get kind of mixed up and confused if you do that. So whenever you're creating a list, it should really just have one purpose to store one type of data for one single purpose. And don't try and mix it up. All elements should be related. A list is actually stored in the computer's memory. We can see kind of with this representation here that's from your textbook, this red box is the actual list. It's in the computer's memory. and we don't really care how the computer stores it, we just know that it's going to have this list of this many elements that I could add or subtract from. Its identifier or name is called values here in this example, but you can see that values isn't storing anything. There's no, no number or element next to values. It's pointing to this list, so the name is actually a reference to the list. This is going to be in the computer's memory, and the name that I give the list is a reference to it. That's pretty valuable information to know because I can use values as a parameter and it's going to point to this list no matter what. So I can actually change a list in a function. I don't have to pass, I can by just by passing in the identifier of the list, whatever happens in that function is going to change in the computer's memory. This is significant. It doesn't happen with any other variables. We'll just kind of think about that as we go throughout this chapter. How do you create a list in Python? Well, first of all, you have to give it a name or identifier. And just like any other kind of variable, it should be descriptive. You're going to use square brackets to um, indicate to the computer that this is a list and not a variable. So here are some examples. Here, the name of my list is test scores. I use the square brackets and inside I would list all the values. Now I still can add to this and I can remove from this, but this does set up a list. So it is a variable, a list variable, named test scores where the references test scores and these values would be stored in the computer's memory. 
most of the time when I start a list, I don't really have the values yet. I'm going to start a, I'm going to create an empty list. So I have the square brackets that's going to indicate an empty list, and I give it a name, and it's going to have a reference with just, and it's going to, the computer's going to set up a section in memory to store the list. It just doesn't have any elements yet. So remember, the equal sign is going to be in between. I have the variable name, equals, and I have the square brackets. So that's going to indicate that I'm creating a list. I'm going to add elements to the list by using the append method. Now this is a method. Remember what that means. A method uses dot notation. We did this with our finch robot, where our finch was the object. So we had finch dot and then whatever the method was. And of course I have to use parentheses. Here's some examples. My list is going to be the list object. So my list dot append is the method. And then in parentheses I pass in some argument. What am I going to append? I could append a literal value like 5, or I could append a value of a variable. As long as x already has a value, I can append it. So append is a method. I use the dot notation with my object. My list is my object because it's going to go in front. Let's get into Python and actually try this. We're going to create a list, and we're going to append some numbers to it. We're here in Code Sculptor, and we're going to start a new program. So I've already got my heading up here. Make sure you do the same thing. We're going to start by just creating a main function and creating a list and just doing some appending to see how it's all going to work out. So let's create a main function. And the first thing I'm going to do is create my list. So I'm just actually going to call it my list. And remember, we're going to use the square brackets to indicate a list. So right now I have an empty list. In order to add elements to it, I'm going to use the append method. So remember that the list is the object. It goes first. Dot and then append is the method. And it needs one argument. What is the element that I'm going to add to the list? Maybe I want to use add the element 5. And if I want to keep adding, I just keep appending. So I can append as much as I want. So right now I have a list with two elements, and those elements are 5 and 10. Now, you're not really going to know the elements that you want to add like this. Usually you're going to ask the user for some information and then add it, or maybe you're going to generate some random numbers. So let's try also doing this by asking the user for a number. So I'm going to do x equals, and let's just ask. So I'm going to do an input. Enter a number, and then I'm going to append this. So my list dot append, and now x has a value. I can append it. Now I have a list with three values: five, ten, and whatever the number the person entered. I can also do a random number. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to import randint. And you can do it the shortcut way or the long way. And I'm going to get another value. So I'm going to call this y. And let's do um, a number between 1 and 50. And then I'm going to append it. So now I have a list with four elements. I have 5 and 10. And then whatever the user entered, x and a random number, y. You have to be a little bit careful. Notice that when I did list, when I created the list, I used the square brackets. When I'm using append, I'm using parentheses because append is a method. And this 5 and 10, all these things are indicate the argument. So methods use parentheses, but lists start with the square bracket. It can be a little confusing, something for you just to kind of get used to. There are going to be some other times that we use the square bracket, but whenever we call a method or a function, always parentheses, so keep that in mind. Now, usually when I'm going to be appending to a list, I'm going to do a whole bunch of numbers from the user or a whole bunch of random numbers. So let's go ahead and modify this a little bit by creating a helper function just to fill my list. So let's call this fill list. This will be the fill list function. I'm going to pass in my list as a parameter. Now remember that it's really just a reference to the same list. So the list is over here in the computer memory, you know, not here literally, but it's in the computer's memory somewhere, and my list points to it. This same art parameter right here is going to point to the same list. So whatever happens in the function is going to happen to 
the actual list of the computer memory. It will change it. I don't have to return it. That's pretty handy. I'm going to just ask for some random numbers. Maybe I don't even know how many random numbers. So let's just find out. Let's do um, number equals, and I'm going to ask the user how many numbers they want to fill. So how many values for your list? And let's just ask them. And then I'm going to use a for loop go up to that number to generate a random number and append it to the list. So um, I can call it anything. Let's just say count in range num. I'm going to start at zero and go always one less than num. I'm going to get a random number. Let's just call it x. Remember to be careful with your variables. I've got three distinct numbers here. If I use count here, I don't want to use count here. If I use x here, don't use x there. So keep every variable unique. So let's get a random number. And you can pick the range if you'd like. Hopefully you're following along with me. So I'm just going to keep it at 1 to 50. Get that random number. And then from my list, append x. So I'm going to fill um, my list with number of random numbers. If I do that, I can kind of just take out all of this. After I create my list, I'm going to call this helper function. So fill list and pass in my list as the argument. I'm going to create the empty list and I'm going to fill it by calling this helper function. It's going to ask you how many values and it's going to generate that many random numbers and append it. I'm going to go ahead and let's test this. So I'm going to call main and hopefully we don't get any. Okay, so I just did the wrong import random. And let's do 10 numbers. Okay, now nothing happens that you can see. It's all happening behind the scenes. I have actually filled my list with 10 random numbers between 1 and 50. You just can't see them, but they are there. Now this is a good time if you haven't done this yet to go ahead and save your program. You really don't want to wait till the last minute. Uh, anything could happen, so go ahead and save your program in Cold Sculptor if you haven't done so yet. You're going to take your URL, you're going to create a new document in your Google Docs, create a new folder for Chapter 6, create a new document to keep track. This is the list introduction program and, and uh, paste your URL there so you always have it. You can always come back to it if anything should happen. And you can just keep saving new versions of this. and That will be a great idea. Now that we've filled our list with some random numbers, let's talk about how we can actually access each element. Each element in a list stays in the order that it was put in. It is sequential, although you can change the order. We're going to talk about that later. Even if you change the order, the list has an order to it. It's always going to be sequential. So each element is assigned an index, starting at 0 and going to 1 less than its length. Since it all has the same name, it's all called my list, but it has multiple values, how do I know which value I want to um, access? I'm going to do that with the index. The element can be accessed also by using the square bracket. So here's another way to use the square brackets. I use the square brackets to start a, a list, but I'm also going to use it to access an element. Here are some examples. Test score could be my list name, and then I have right next to it, there's no equal sign in between, I have the brackets right next to the name. This is referring to a, an element, and the index tells me which element. Zero is the first test score which is at index 0. We've kind of talked about this before, like when we're doing loops. A for loop starts at 0. That's the first iteration. So it's going to be like the same thing in our list. The first element is 0. Here I have my list 5. This is going to be the sixth element. And I'm actually assigning it the value 10. So I can do something like this. It's not going to happen that often, but you might want to do something like this. I've used the square brackets right next to the list name, and that's meaning an element versus the list itself. 
Now here I'm taking the fourth element and I'm assigning it to something. So you can kind of see I can use a list on either side of the equal sign either to assign it a value or take its single value, just one value out of this whole list and assign it to a different variable. So this line of code right here gives the fourth value of the list to the variable number. Let's try this in our code. Let's try accessing some of our elements. We're back in Python. Here's the code that we listed so far. And we're going to add to our main function some print statements to actually access some of these elements. So let's just print the first value. So I have my list. I'm going to use the square bracket right next to it, no equal sign in between. I'm going to put zero. I'm going to access the first element in my list and let's see what it is. Let's go ahead and put 10 values again. And the first element was 43. Pretty cool. What about the last element? Should we print this? Now I happen to know, since I said 10, that, that the last element will be at 9. But if I don't know the length, I want to be careful about doing this. We can do this if we know we're going to put in 10. Let's just try it again. And I'm going to say 10. So the first element was 29, the last element was 7. What would happen if I put a 10 right here? What will happen if I put an index that really doesn't exist? Let's see. I'm going to put in 10 elements, but those elements are going to be 0 through 9, and I want to access the um, element at index 10. And I'm going to get a list index out of range error. This is one of the most common errors that you can have when you're working with a list, is that you try and put in an index that doesn't exist. So this is something to be aware of. You can see what the, what the error message looks like. You want to be careful that you don't do this. We're going to talk about some kind of foolproof ways, but just kind of keep this in the back of your mind also as you're working. Now let's do like the fourth element. The fifth element, we could do every element. Okay. Get our square brackets right next to our variable name. Oop, not a curly cube bracket. Make sure you use the square brackets. And let's print the last one again. If I'm always going to say 10. I've got some values there. What if I want every one of them? This is sequential, so using some, and I used a for loop to give the list some values. So it really just kind of makes sense that I can use a for loop to print out all the values. We can do this. There are two ways to um, print. We're going to be calling this traversing a list. And we're, there's two ways to do it, and I'm going to show you one to begin with so you don't get too confused. When you want to access every element in a list, it's called traversing a list. Traverse is like travel. If you can kind of think about it like that, traversing a list, traveling a list, I want to access each element in order because a list is sequential. So traversing means to access each element of a list in order from the beginning to the end usually, or you can go in reverse order. There are two ways to traverse a list. You can do it by index because you know that every element has an index. But you can also do it by element, which is kind of like a shortcut way. So, so this is the way I'm going to show you first, the by element. Here's an example of traversing a list by element. I'm going to use a for loop, but instead of trying to use a count or a range, I can simply say for element, and this can be anything. You don't have to use the word element. This is a variable that represents each element. So it could be for value, for number, for anything. In my list, and this is the name of your list, I want to print element. So whatever I use here, like my counter, I would put right here. And it will simply go in order. It's going to give me a list going down. So to keep all the elements on a single line, you're going to add a comma. And that's going to be up to you. Let's go ahead and try this. We're back here in Cold Sculptor, and we've got a function already for filling the list. So let's create a function for printing the list. And I'm going to call it print my list, and I am going to pass in my list variable as a parameter. 
And I'm going to use a for loop. I don't need to ask how many because I actually am going to use the shortcut and it just intuitively knows. So if I use the example from the PowerPoint, I'm going to say for element in my list. Careful with your typing there. I'm just going to print the element. Okay. Doesn't get much more easy than that. I'm going to come here to main. I'm going to take out all these print statements where I just accessed one element at a time. And I'm going to call print list. Pass in as an argument my list. Let's give this a try. Let's try 10 values again. And there should be 10 random numbers between 0 and 50. Let's try 5 values. And there they are. So I can do as many values as I want. And I fill it with a for loop and I print it with a for loop. If I want the elements to go across instead of down, then I'm just going to put a comma right there. Print element comma. And you see that they go across. Now I also am still at the same line because I ended up with a comma. So here's one little tip. If you want to do this, which I think is a really handy thing, you really need to end with a print. It's going to take this comma, because right now my cursor is still right here, and take me to the next line. So we're going to do 10 again. And now if I was to print something else, it would print underneath instead of next to. So just kind of a little handy tip if you're going to be using this shortcut. If you want the comma at the end to keep everything on in a single line, then remember to do a print after your for loop, not inside. Now is a good time to save and keep track of your URL in your Google Doc. So far we have talked about one list method and that is the append. There are several. We're going to take it slow and just introduce you a to a couple of them at a time. So I'm only going to talk about one other list method at this for this program and that's the sort method. Since it is a method, you will use the dot notation and the list variable is going to be the object in front of the dot. It's going to keep all the elements in the list, but it will rearrange them in order from lowest to highest. So it's still going to be sequential. It's just not going to be in a kind of a randomish order, but it will be rearranged. Everything, every element will still have an index. That index is just going to change as it gets rearranged. This method does not have an argument or return a value. And here's an example. My list was my object dot sort, and I still have to have parentheses because it's a method, but no argument and no equals, it's not returning a value. Let's try this. Here we are in Code Sculptor. We've already got two great helper functions going on. We've got our main where we where we declare our list and we fill it in our printed. Now let's sort it and then let's print it again. I'm going to come here in main and remember I'm going to use dot notation. So my list dot sort and it's a method and it needs parentheses. Let's print again. So the first time I print is going to be in the original order that it gets filled. I'm going to sort it and I'm going to print it again. Let's see what it looks like. Let's do 10 values. You can see the first line is the original, so I've got it just kind of randomish numbers, and then the second line is after the sort. No information is lost. The values, the data is just rearranged smallest to highest. So this can come in handy, especially if you're trying to find things like the mean and median and mode. You need to have things in order to find them. It's just a handy thing, but I have changed my list, so I can't go back to this. Once I sort it, it is this. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Now let's talk about some list functions. So lists have methods, but they also have some functions which can work with a variety of different types of objects. A method only works with one type of object in the class that is declared. 
and functions can work with multiple objects. So we have four functions here we're going to work with that work with other things besides lists. We're just going to apply them to lists. Remember that functions do not use dot notation. It's, we're going to call it like any other function. The function comes first, and then if there is an argument, it comes in parentheses. All these functions are going to have an argument, and that is the list itself. Here are some common list functions that we're going to use. Len, sum, max, and min. Len stands for the length. It's going, going to tell us how many elements or values are in the list. This is a really handy thing to know because our list length can change. Sometimes it might start out 10. If we remove some or if we add some, append them, then the length changes. So at any given time when you want to do something with that length, like a for loop because we're traversing the loop or we're accessing an, an item and we don't want to have go past, have the wrong index, knowing the length of a list is really important. So len is just short for length that will tell us how many elements are in that. Remember the index is always going to be one less. So if I have 10 elements, then my index is 0 to 9. Sum is going to take all the elements, assuming that it's some kind of a numeric value, and add them up. It's going to give us an automatic sum. We've done this in functions before where we just took all the values and we added them up. Now we don't have to do that. This one simple function call will give us the sum. Also, we have max, it will tell us the highest value, and min will tell us the lowest value. We've done these kinds of things before, like for the bowling scores, where we had to write a function to do it, and it's built in with lists. Let's give it a try. We're back here at our Cold Sculptor program, and I'm going to keep everything the way it is. I'm just going to add some more things. So I'm already printing my list, but let's just print some more results as well. I'm going to define another function. I'm going to call this print results. I'm still going to use my list as a parameter. And I'm going to already have my sorted list right here. Everything's great, but now I want to find out the length, the max, the min. Maybe I even want to find out the average. So I'm just going to do some more prints. I'm going to start off with a print statement and let's do print the um, number of elements. And I'm going to do len. This is the function, and the argument is my list. So you see how it looks different from the dot notation. This is our method, and this is our function. So the method is after the dot, but a function comes first, and the object is the argument. So it takes a little bit of getting used to if you're going to kind of go back and forth a lot with lists. Sometimes it's a function, sometimes it's a method. You have to memorize which one is which so you call it correctly. Let's use the max. Or let's use the sum next. The sum of elements. And I'm going to use the sum function. So it comes first. And the list is the argument. And let's do the max. The highest value. And I'm going to use max. And let's do the lowest. And I'm going to use min. So I've got four functions here. I'm going to call this helper function. And that's print results with my list as an argument. Let's give it a try. Let's try 10 random numbers again. I've got my unsorted list. I've got my sorted list. I've got the num number of elements is 10, the, high, the sum, the high, and the low. And you can kind of check it out and even see the high and the low. Now if I have it sorted, I know that the high is going to be the last and I know the low is going to be the smallest. So you can even kind of find other ways of doing it. Now what about finding the average? With this information right here, can I find the average? Well sure, I can take the sum and the number and I can divide them. So let's come back over here to print results and let's add in one more. Print the average of the elements. And I'm going to use the sum function. So go ahead and do sum. 
and I'm going to divide by the length. Now both of these are integers, so ask yourself what kind of value am I going to get for the average. And I got 31 an integer. If I want this to be a decimal, what do I need to do? Well, one of them needs to be float, so I can change this to a float, or I can multiply times 1.0. There's multi many things we can do here. So you decide, do you want to keep it an integer, or do you want to make it a float? And if so, you have to do your math appropriately. Now is a good time to save your code if you haven't done so already. Copy and paste it into your Google Doc so you have, you're have keeping track of your code. I hope you are following along as we went through your first list program. And this is something that you are actually going to turn in for a grade. So here are some requirements. You're going to use Cold Sculptor. For Finch Robotics, we use the idle environment, but we can go back to Cold Sculptor now. It's it's in our comfort zone, so let's go ahead and do that. Although everything that we're doing now works just the same in idle, so you can try it. Remember to include comments at the beginning of your program that includes the name and the name of the program. You should have at least two helper functions. If you followed along with me, then you have three, and you have a main function. You declared and used a list. Follow the instructions in this video so that you get some random numbers for your list that you append, you print your list, you sort your list, and then you use len, max, min, and sum. When your program is complete, save the code and keep your URL in a document for future reference. You're also going to submit the URL to the teacher in the turn-in form for a grade. And this is the end of this video lecture, and hopefully you have your first list program, your intro to list program, and you're getting used to using lists. This is going to be a really powerful tool for this chapter.